10 minutes to 11, there was no Sunday school class. Maybe 15 to 11, there was no Sunday school class, meaning the auditorium. There were a few people who were already come but didn't come to Sunday school. And I was just standing there looking. And uh, a guy got up and walked back to me and he looked at me and he said, did you used to be Glenn Matthews? <laughs> now, how do you answer that? And I said, yeah, I was. He said, no, I mean, did you used to be Glenn Matthews, the preacher? I said, yeah, I was. So I'm the used to be, I suppose. But I'm glad to be here. I enjoyed your singing. I was about the last half, that was terrific. Really good. Thank you so much. Open your Bibles this morning to the book of First John, First John, chapter two. Sought the Lord's will as to what I should talk about this morning, and this is the passage to which the Lord has led me. If you study for ministry go to a Bible college, you take classes in Greek, and it doesn't matter where you go to school, whether it's fundamental or liberal, if you're studying the biblical language of Greek, New Testament, you will start in the book of 1 John. It doesn't matter where you go to school. And there's reasons for that, and one big reason is it is the easiest book to read in the New Testament language. It's the place to begin. And I started trying to preach 65 years ago. I'm still trying. When I grow up, I'm going to be a cowboy, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep on doing this for a while longer, at least I hope. 65 years, and I find myself going back to refresh my Greek and going to 1 John. It is an exceedingly rich book. I want to talk this morning and call your attention to the last two verses. Actually, verse 28 of 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Can you hear me all right in the back? I've got to take my hearing aids out. You, you know you're getting old when you have to Put on your glasses, put on your hearing aids before you can say to your wife, do you know where my glasses are? <laughs> and she has told me that if I leave my hearing aids in, I don't talk loudly enough. So, so I will try to speak loudly enough for you to hear me. Father, bless this your word. Thank you for the music we've enjoyed and for the talents you've given to these three who have blessed us with your music. Now, when we look into this, your word, may the blessed Holy Spirit neither be grieved nor quenched, but that our minds be focused upon this, your word, and you be glorified in what I say and what we all do with what we hear. And we'll give you praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Again, verse 28, 1 John 2. And now, little children, abide in him that when we shall appear, when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. The title of the message, What We Should Do and Why. Little children abide in him. Why? So that when he appears, 
we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. The phrase, little children, is literally little born ones. It's used no less than nine times in this little book of five chapters. It's interesting to see little born ones and the context of it. Look in chapter 2, verse 1. My little born ones, little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. Verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you. Verse 13. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. Verse 18. Little children, it is the last time and that you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, thereby, whereby we know that it is the last time. Time. Our text in verse 28 again, little children. Look in chapter 3, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and you have overcome them, that spirit of Antichrist, because Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Chapter 4, verse 17. Now, not that verse. Chapter 5, and I'm looking. These things have a right unto you that believe. Look in verse 21. This, little children, little born ones, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Well, God our Father, no, God our Creator. Yes. We're all creatures of God, but only those who know Christ as their Savior can say that God is your Father. Hmm. Question, have you been born of God? Hmm. There are levels of life. There is mineral life. Above that there is plant life. And the plant gets its nourishment strength from the minerals in the soil. And above the and above the plant life there is animal life. And the animals eat the plants. And above that there's human life and we eat the animals. But above all of those is spirit life. The reason the plant is a plant, it was made that way. It was born that way. You may have a smart dog, but your dog is a dog. Yeah. You may call it by a human name and treat it like a baby, but it's an animal yeah. because it was born that way. You're a human being because you were born that way. But the highest level of life is spirit life. And you must be born of the Spirit of God in order for you to say you are one of God's little born ones, God's child. You know, you can be very religious and never know Christ. I preach every week to people who are faithful in church attendance and have given mental assent to a group of historical facts. But as far as knowing personally the Lord Jesus as Savior, they're not God's little born ones. Amen. Yeah. Are you born of God? This is they who are addressed. Christians, born ones of God. Second thing I see in the verse is the admonition, little children abide in Him. In this little book of five chapters, the word abide or abideth is used eight different times in five chapters. To abide means to not just reside, but it means to reside with enjoyment. 
to feel at home, to be in fellowship with others in the home. Are you abiding? Isn't it odd that we should have to tell people who are, quote, risen with Christ, Colossians 3, and since, because, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. <coughs> Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, for you're dead with Christ, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Are you to abide means to be in fellowship with. Now, I was born in the home of a Baptist preacher, and I abided in that home until I was 17 and left to go to college. But there were many times as a resident that I wasn't abiding. I was amazed how smart my daddy became when I was 21 compared to what he was when I was 13 and following. <coughs> a lot of times we were not in fellowship, and every time that was true, it was my fault. Are you abiding with Christ? It means to be an open, in an open, honest relationship. It means keeping no secrets from. <coughs> Are you abiding in Christ? Residing is one thing. Abiding is another thing. Right. Are you abiding in Christ? <coughs> there is a song in our hymn book, Constantly Abiding, <coughs> Jesus is Mine. I won't take the time to read the song to you, but be well for you to think about the verses of that song. It's a constant abiding. Jesus is mine, and that means that I am his as well. On the evening following his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples. Thomas was absent. I don't know why. Maybe he was afraid. Maybe it was Super Bowl weekend. I don't know. But he wasn't there. A week later, Jesus appeared to them again, and Thomas was there. And when Thomas, who had said, I will not believe unless I can see and touch. I want to see him, and I want to touch the wounds in his hands and in his side. And except I believe that, I will not believe. But when Thomas saw the Lord, he didn't have to touch. He yeah. just cried out in our English Bible, my Lord and my God. That makes it sounds like Thomas possesses the Lord. And that's true. He was his Lord. But the word really, or the verse really reads this way. Lord of me and God of me. Now who is the possessor? You see the difference? To abide is to recognize his lordship over your life. Again and again, eight times, abide or abide. Are you really in fellowship with Him? You know, if you are in fellowship with Him, you could begin every prayer with, and now, Lord. Have you ever started a prayer with that? And now, Lord? That presumes that you've been in contact with and in fellowship with him all the time since the last time you prayed. <coughs> you could begin a prayer with, and now, Lord. If you keep close accounts with God and you rest in him, recognizing his lordship over your life and responding to that lordship, as his servant, you could start the prayer, and now, Lord. The question is, are you abiding? You have to answer that. Not residing, but abiding. The third thing I see in the verse is this appearance. When he 
shall appear. Not if, but if you really, it's since he shall appear. With no question, he will appear. The word to appear is actually a theoretic, a, can't even say with a word, a term from the theater. You go to the see the play, and you've got a stage, it's got depth and breadth to it, and off in the wings behind the curtain are characters who will appear in the play. Maybe one person on the stage giving a monologue, and when the time for another a person to appear, that person will out. Now you can see them when they come out from behind the curtain, but they just don't step out behind the curtain at the edge and stand there. No, they come to what is called center stage or down center stage. They're not in the background, they're not in the wings, they walk to the edge of the stage. That's to abide or to appear. It has the idea of making fully manifested. I have been to Israel many times, taken hundreds of people to Israel, going again November of 2019, Lord willing. One of these days I'll get too old to go, but I'm going again, Lord willing, November of next year. And I have been every place where our Lord walked, but I've never seen him. I met him by faith a little over 71 years ago. Amen. I've walked with him, I've abided with him, but I've never seen him with my natural eye. But one day, he will appear. Amen. And I will see him, as John says, as he is. You realize what that talks about? It talks about in his fullness, in his beauty, in his glory, in his majesty, in his power. And when I see him, thank God, I'm going to be like him. Amen. That's right. I'm far from perfect now, but eventually I'm going to be like his. Amen. Amen. He shall appear. Where? The mockers, the scoffers. Where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation, even to now. They are willingly ignorant that the same word of God that brought the flood will someday bring the fire. Okay. Now, ignorance can be corrected with education. We were born ignorant to the fact that two and two is four. Somebody told you. You learned that. Ignorance can be corrected. But stupidity is terminal. Yeah. And when you are willingly ignorant, that's stupid. Yeah. The vast majority of the world does not believe in Jesus at all, much less that he shall appear, and much less that he shall appear just like the Bible says. But I know from the Scripture, I know from experience that the Lord Jesus will appear, and he will not be standing in the shadows. We sing that song, standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. But when he appears down center stage in full view, we shall behold him. Amen. Thank God. Amen. These are homecoming days. Amen. Last week on a Sunday morning, I preached a homecoming service in Winston-Salem. Different place, different message. These two were there. And I told you I wouldn't be preaching the same thing. But it's a season of homecoming. We really ought to be focusing, and it's good to have a homecoming. People come back and visit, and make new friends, and overeat, and all of that. But we really ought to be thinking about homecoming. Amen. 
Amen. Yeah. No, not homecoming, home going. Because we're going. Right. And the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Amen. The voice of the archangel trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive. Paul thought he was going to be alive when the Lord came. We which are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is Jesus is coming. Yeah. That's the good news. The bad news is Jesus is coming. <laughs> because if you're a little born one, that's a blessing. That's right. You rejoice. You anticipate it. And by the way, if you're abiding, you're anticipating. But if you're not saved, if you're not God's child, little born one, then it's bad news for you. That's right. Because you're going to meet him. There are five things that everybody's going to do. And it's so fun to preach and not even notice my own notes. I can now just interrupt myself any time I want to. I can preach as long as I have, you can do that too. Five things everybody's going to do. Everybody. Saved and unsaved. Now I'm not talking with reference to, to time or the chronology. But there is a day when everybody will see the Lord. Yep. Right, yes, right. If you're saved, that's great. If you're not saved, that's horrible. That's right. You want to see the Lord. Secondly, you want to stand before the Lord. Yeah. Yes. You're going to stand before the Lord. And, number three, you're going to give an accounting of yourself to God. Yeah. That's a bookkeeping term. Accounting. Not what have you done, but why have you done what you have done? And why haven't you done what you should have done? Yeah. You're going to give an account. So then every one of us shall give an accounting of himself to God. The fourth thing everybody will do is receive from the Lord what is right. Mm. He's the judge. And he will give what is right. If you're saved, enter in to the joy of your Lord. If you're not saved, depart into the regions of the damned. The final thing that everybody, saved or unsaved, is going to do is everybody is going to bow your knee and confess yeah. that yeah. Jesus Christ is Lord right. to the glory of God the Father. If you're unsaved, you're going to say that. And you know who else will say that? The devil himself yeah. will have to say that. Yeah. Jesus Amen. is Lord. Are you anticipating the appearing of our Lord? Amen. When I was a child, we would go to my <coughs> grandfather Malam's house. And we had, I had 29 first cousins on my mother's side of the family, six more on my father's side. But we would go to Chris Milo's house. And oh, <coughs> monstrous big table. And it's a Sunday afternoon and just a mob of people. Her dining room was bigger than her kitchen, and her kitchen was bigger than most kitchens, and her pantry is was bigger than. Most kitchens are now. And uh, we would all eat together, fellowship together at that table. It was a great time. And I've lost my thought. I am pre everything. I'm a preemie. I'm, so they told me I was 10 pounds when I was born and three weeks overdue. So I've been late ever since, as you can attest. <laughs> I wasn't a preemie, but I am now. I'm pre-stroke, pre-diabetes, uh, pre-death, obviously pre-dead, and pre-dementia. So I'm a preemie, and I just lost the thought that I had. I can. Oh, we're going to see the Lord. It's inescapable. Yeah. You're going to confess. 
that Jesus is Lord. See me at lunch and it will come back to my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Those who are addressed are little children, born ones. The admonition abide in him. The appearing when he shall appear. The assurance that we may have boldness. That's a strong word. It's used in Acts 4 where the people in the midst of persecution prayed that with all boldness we will speak. It's the same word that is used. Let us come boldly to a throne of grace. It's used to Paul that he spoke with boldness. It means confidence. Not, not conceit, but confidence. It's a word of assurance. Abide that when he shall appear. Not if, but when. We shall have boldness, confidence. Let us come with boldness to a throne of grace. Same word. We'll have confidence before him. If I focus my mind, what's left of it, on just the rapture of the church, the Lord coming and resurrecting and rapturing us, I can shout like anybody else. But when I let my mind go a step beyond that and I come to the place called the judgment seat of Christ, I lose my shout. Yeah. Every morning before my feet hit the floor, I think I have to give an account to God for what I do this day. <coughs> Thoughts, words, deeds. Every, I'm going to give an accounting to God. And I want to be on the welcoming committee when He appears. I want to meet Him with boldness. And not be ashamed before Him. The word ashamed literally is disfigured. Mm. Really. Let's hypothetical case. Let's say beautiful 17 year old young lady, fine woman, young Christian girl was involved in a terrible wreck, car wreck. Not her fault. Let's say she was a passenger but maybe she didn't have on a seat belt. But whatever, she went through the windshield and undergo many surgeries over many months and plastic surgery repairing her face that was disfigured. This verse is saying, when he appears, we may have confidence, boldness, and not be disfigured before him. That's what that verse says. I had a brilliant friend, philosopher, Christian philosopher, taught philosophy, University of Southern California for years, died of cancer. Before his death, when it was imminent, evident that he was going to die, he wrote a friend. This, he was a preacher and a professor at Liberal University of Southern California and head of the philosophy department of that school. And he wrote a preacher friend of his and said, I would hope by the grace of God to be dead for a good while before I realize it. <laughs> and he went on to explain that if I have been being conformed to the image of God's Son, I should be look close to looking like it by the time that I die, so that after I die, I'll say, oh, this is not much different than it was before. Yeah. I walked with him, I abide the boat with him, my faith, now it's by sight. We'll not be ashamed, disfigured for him, before him. Yeah. I was born and raised in West Virginia. 82 years ago. 
Bible fact. If you're not born in West Virginia, you need to be born again. That's just, that's just <laughs> of course, if you're born somewhere else, even in West Virginia, you need to be born again. World War II, Pearl Harbor. I was six years and two days old on December the 7th, 1941. It wasn't long before some of my older cousins, and I told you I had 29 of them on my mother's side, and some of my young uncles were called to military service. Some drafted, many of them volunteered. The Chesapeake and Ohio Railroads came through Charleston west to east, and they came into this depot in Charleston at 2 o'clock in the morning. My daddy, my mother, dragged the three of us out of bed, and we all would go to that CNO train station. The troop trains were coming east. They stopped, and not just my cousins and uncles, but literally scores of people, men and women, mostly men, getting on those troop trains to go east and to begin military service. I remember standing there on a wagon, a mail wagon, watching them go when I was six. Four years later, 1945, they began, began to come back. Now those who had served in Europe, they came in from New York, through New York and westbound train. They came in in the afternoon, that was okay. But those who were in the Pacific, they came in through California and then trained across the country day after day until at two o'clock in the morning, here they came and here we were. And uh, my daddy and mother took us and I watched them. I remember my uncle coming and he stepped off of the car first but he didn't come running to his wife. He stood there and checked off everybody who came off of that train, and off of that car, handed it to somebody on the train, saluted it, then here he came. And reunion, homecoming, great time. I stood there on another cart, watching a wagon, watching all of this. Now, as they left and started out, people just stood around and talked. Nobody was in a hurry to leave, though it was after two. But when they came in, and you know, it's not like an airplane taxiing to the terminal and everybody coming off the same door while they were up and down the track. And here they came running, and when the military man found his family, they were gone. Since my uncle was one of the last ones off, we were standing there, and I watched a strange thing. I watched a man get off the train with his sea bag over his shoulder, and he took a step or two and stood there and looked, and just looked. And I thought, nobody's meeting him. And then I looked to the side, and standing against the depot, was a young lady. I didn't know a lot. I wasn't quite 10. Five-year-old kids know more about life than I did when I was 10. And finally, he just dropped his bag and walked a few steps to where she was. And they stood there, not hugging, not kissing. And then finally, he put took his arm around, not around her, but on her arm, and they walked off into the darkness, him carrying their sea bag. I knew enough to know that that woman was very pregnant, because I had seen my aunts with pregnancies. We're driving to our home. My brother and sister are asleep in the back seat. I'm in the middle of the back seat, and I leaned forward and said, Daddy, I want you to explain for me. And I told him the story. 
<laughs> he was the last one off of the train. Nobody but that one woman. They didn't hug or kiss, but he put his arm in her arm and he let her off. I said, what does that mean? My daddy said, I can still hear it. My daddy said, son, I didn't see that, but I can only guess. That was his wife, and she was expecting a baby by somebody other than him. And immediately I got angry. I, I get angry now. 1945, I still get angry at this point. You mean? Yeah. You, you mean? He's over there in the Pacific fighting and she, yeah. I wouldn't have taken her, is what I said. Why did he take her? My daddy said, son, I guess he felt like he had to. <coughs> she was ashamed before him at his coming. Now I remember the dining room, the kitchen, and the pantry store. <laughs> it's true. I'll tell it to you before I forget it again. Always a lot of biscuits. And what wasn't eaten was put in that big pantry. My brother, who is Joe Cool, two years older than me, and he was about six and I was four, our little sister two, or he was seven, I was five, and she was three. But he's sneaky Pete. He would say, I'm going to stand here and I can see in the living room and I can see in grandmother's bedroom. She was bed fast with a stroke. Nobody's in the dining room, but he would stand where he could see into grandmother's bedroom and then he could hear the conversation in the living room. He said, you go in there and get us a biscuit. And I would go steal a biscuit. In fact, I would steal three of them. And on the way home, suddenly I would say, look what I found. And I would pass out biscuits. My sister and my brother would be hungry again because we'd been playing all afternoon. And uh, my brother stood there anticipating somebody coming, but not desiring it. That was the story. Yeah. You believe the Lord is coming? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you anticipating it? Or are you yeah. dreading it? My brother wasn't warning somebody to come through and see us stealing biscuits. And he didn't care. That's the end. She didn't care, but it was much more fun to steal it and not get caught, and then confess and say, yeah, I took it. When he comes, will you have boldness or will you be ashamed at his coming? You go into heaven as a pauper? He's coming. Amen. You're going to see him. You're going to stand before him. You're going to give an account to him. He will give you, reward you with what is right, and you're going to confess that He's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Mm -hmm. If you've not done that yet, you should do that today. Yeah. We're going to sing a song. You walk down the aisle, Pastor Nance, take somebody, have somebody take you, sit with you, read the Word of God with you, pray with you, and you can become a little born one of God. You've been sitting a long time. Stand, if you will, please, and let's pray. <coughs>